It's a new day, and with cautious optimism, we rise once more, ready for a new and different journey. I'm Jeff Oppenheim, filmmaker, content creator, digital journalist, and storyteller, inviting you to join me for tomorrow's journey. Today, we launch on a journey, well, about one of my most favorite topics in the world. A guilty pleasure, if you would, and arguably a little bit dicey, unless you're a gentleman about it. What do I refer to? Well, girls, women, ladies. No, 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 stop right there. Not that way, not cool. But I will be talking about beauty, sensuality, sexuality. And if you uh, want some old sage advice, you might want to stick around, especially the men in the group, because you're going to hear the voice of someone who is not only an incurable romantic, but also, for that matter, a dyed-in-the-wool feminist. And you might just learn what separates the boys from the men. Join me. I have to say, I've had the great pleasure of knowing a lot of wonderful women. Uh, now, I'm not bragging. Well, I am, but not about me, about them. You see, I've known a great number of gals, both personally and, well, professionally as well. And that is to say, I've had the joy of supporting the women that are more intimately connected to my life in their professional pursuits. But I've also had that great joy of supporting professional women in their pursuits and letting them know I take it personally too. And I gotta say, all in all, I'm a big fan. See, in my work, I get to meet, experience, and support the beauty of women. Some of my work has been within the fashion and beauty sector, in fact. But even in producing and directing for film, I'm responsible to oversee hair, makeup, wardrobe, as well as lights and camera angles. And yet, though I may fall short of recognizing some of the many color names, wait, isn't vermilion Vietnamese spaghetti? Uh, oh no, that's vermicelli. Sorry, never mind. I do relish working with the talents of the crew toward our common goal of making our actress or model or even our interviewees radiate. Because as I've learned, this lens of beauty that we more often see women through can ultimately be a full empowerment for them. I would say that the individual owns the beauty. That's Heather a fragrance and beauty professional with a few decades of experience. She's worked for makeup companies like MAC, lingerie companies like Agent Provocateur, ooh la la, BB Fragrance, which is where we first worked with the lovely and talented Nina Agdal. Woo. And she's a dynamic entrepreneur who launched her own lipstick brand, The Sexiest Beauty, for which I helped create The Sexiest Truth Campaign. See, as Heather will tell you, beauty is not only very subjective, it is delicate. Sexy, which means something different to everyone. You know, what makes me feel sexy, it's confidence, it's, it's, it's um, being authentic, you know, it's really organic. And so it's to bring that out in each person, to have them feel their own inner beauty. And let's face it, it's not just men. Who are doing the judging. The campaign that we did was with real beauties from a variety of places. Sexy. <laughs> really speaking their beauty and what it meant to them. Women simply want to look good for themselves and for their fellow sisters. Oh, and of course, gay men. I am beautiful. I'm beautiful. Mommy looks delicious. What would you say to yourself <laughs> when you look in the mirror? Beautiful, damn it. I am the sexiest beauty. This is my sexiest beauty. Which, you know, you may not think to say, oh, I'm, I'm beautiful or I'm sexy or I'm strong. But self-talk is really important. So if we can start to have those conversations with ourself in the mirror, in the vanity, I think it's a really good way to start the day. We could call it a sisterhood of the traveling pants. Yeah, I, I saw the film. I mean, just the first one. And I had the cover of my then very young daughter. Absolutely, there's a sisterhood. I think there always has been 
um, sharing tips and tricks and, and with each other and, and with your girlfriends and with family and now we can take that as we were just talking about we can take that to across the world of social media and share that with others. I think on that foundational scene you know when the Latina tells her friends that there is no way the same pair of jeans that fit all of her flack of white chick friends is going to wrap around her fine Latina slightly fuller curves well it does of course and thus further cements their bond. I mean, think about it. This is really a girl power kind of a thing, right? You don't hear a bunch of guys running around saying, let's share the same pair of pants. Yo, bro, you want to do what? To empower us how? But here's the dirty little secret that even that movie doesn't go into. I've heard women say that it's the same group of sisters that they fear the most, like a group of hungry lionesses. It's ten times more fearful than any gay man's queeny fashion rant, because ultimately the gay man's just going to say, child, I'm going to fix you up. <clears throat> and though I have learned through my work that beauty is not uniquely feminine by any means. This goes back to Cleopatra, who was widely recognized to have worn a significant amount of a variety of, of makeup products. To the pharaohs, you see the, the pharaohs and the tombs and, and the, the decorative makeup that, that the men wore at the time. And then follow the, that thread through, as, as with all things, you know, it goes in, in waves of what's popular and, and, and uh, of the day. Um, but today, it's beauty for everyone. Both the badge and the burden is uniquely female. The empowerment of putting on my favorite shade of lipstick, which is generally something, you know, on the bolder side, I almost feel like I'm getting my words across. And as you may have already figured out, on this series, what I like to do is look back so that we gain perspective, so that we can inform tomorrow's journey. So I got to thinking and researching a story that I think epitomizes the curse of beauty. It's the story of America's first supermodel. No, not Naomi Campbell. Oh. But don't worry, as soon as I tell you this story, you're gonna go, oh yes, I've seen her. Especially if you've been to Wisconsin, Atlanta, Cambridge, Mass, San Francisco, or Washington, D.C., to name just a few of the places she lives. In fact, I'd say she was New York City's second most notorious lady. Who's the first? Why, this hussy welcoming strangers. Oh, the girls in France, they don't wear underpants. But unlike Lady Liberty, who hails from France, Audrey was a native-born New York gal. Rochester, New York. Which is why the nation and the world was ever the more shocked when she seemed so willing to be seen naked, uh, nude, uh, without clothes, by so many. The time was the Gilded Era, the turn of the century. That's in 1900s for all you Gen Zers. When a young Audrey, born 1891, raided around by her stage mother, became a young girl of the theater, a chorus gal. From here, she was discovered and put into film. And actually, it was there where she first took off her clothes, becoming the first American movie star to appear in a film naked... Uh, uh, <clears throat> well, in the buff, or in the all-together, as the artist Isidore Conti put it. He spied a then-teenage Audrey at the time, walking down Fifth Avenue with her mother. He approached the two and asked if she would consider being a model for his sculpture he was working on, called The Three Graces. It was to be a part of the decor of the new Astor Hotel, which stood right here. The sculpture has gone the way of the hotel, but photos still exist, and Audrey is proudly featured in various stages of the, in the all together, as the Three Graces. As she would later buoyantly claim, the work was a souvenir to my mother's consent. Now, it may seem like that's no big deal in the era of living with shows like Californication, or I think that show had a plot, did it? Well. Aside from that, even having porn sites at the fingertips of any able-minded teen who can figure out the workarounds of parental controls, just about every single one of them, of course. But back then, it was a big deal, and because of it, Audrey became quite the scandal. Her movie career was cut short just as quickly as it was born. 
Hollywood, even before the Hayes rating systems back in the day, reflected the uptight Protestant moral code of America back then. Even in the later years, when there was a bad girl who, though she kept most of her clothes on, lesson learned, was still ultimately punished by movie's end for her wanton, brazen, hussy ways. And think about it, even today, a guy who's promiscuous, well, he's just called a player. Hmm. But a gal who does the same thing, well, she gets a lot of rap songs written about her. But Audrey, back in the day, no. She paid for it with her career, which is probably why you have never heard of her or never seen any of her movies, even though she only died in 1996. No, Junior, she wasn't the old lady in the Titanic film, though she did pose for the memorial to Isidore and Ida Strauss, who died that ill-fated day. And many more works that still can be seen around the nation. See, she ultimately became the belle and muse of many a sculptor and artistic photographer. She was also to become equally coveted by gentlemen of society, bankers, diplomats, and other ne'er-do-wells, although none of them on the level of serial rapist Harvey Weinstein. Talk about movies having a code of conduct, yikes. Still, one man in Audrey's life, Dr. Walter Wilkins, a 65-year-old physician and the owner of a house on West 65th Street, just up the block, in which Munson and her mother had recently been tenants, allegedly fell so under her charms that he beat his wife to death with a machinist hammer in hopes that Munson would soon then be willing to marry him. It didn't work. He was sentenced to death, but hanged himself in his cell before he could be executed. And even though it's believed that there was really nothing to this romance other than the fantasy of the doctor, Audrey paid a price too, and this scandal contributed to her downfall from, well, the graces. And in fact, this may be why you've never heard of her, even though she was around till 104 years of age. Today, we might call Audrey a free spirit, very Greenwich Village very much a beloved part of the burgeoning New York City art scene. The New York City art scene was led by somebody they called the godmother of Greenwich Village, none other than Gertrude Vanderbilt Whitney, of the Whitney Museum fame. Otherwise known as the poor little rich girl of art, Whitney faced rejection herself when she offered her 700-piece collection to the then male director of the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And even though she offered to give extra money for a separate wing, he said no. Wow, who's sorry now? Gentlemen, make a note, because this is a perfect example of the price you can pay if you don't listen to a lady. As for Audrey, who had less power, of course, and certainly less money than Ms. Whitney did, well, she got cast aside by the male elite society of the day, and even that so-called sisterhood? probably didn't rise to her cause and instead supported the men in the power position. And Audrey paid the ultimate price. On her 40th birthday, she was committed to an insane asylum. Get this, by her mother. She was shipped off to the St. Lawrence State Hospital and it was here where Audrey remained for 64 years until the day she died. Think there's a price to beauty now? Well, you can find out more about Audrey Munson by reading this wonderful book, The Curse of Beauty, by a James Bone, New York Times writer. It's an incredible read. Or you could wait for my documentary to come out. But either way, I'll admit, I'm smitten. Because not only does Audrey's beauty transcend time, her story does too. She represents a cautious tale and a reminder to us all of the delicate balance beauty sensuality and sexuality, or more specifically, all the trappings held within that can play out in a woman's life. Although we might be tempted to say we live in different times where women are certainly entitled to own their own magnificence, 
Audrey's tale is still a painful reminder that the baggage is still there, and it's both self-imposed as well as imposed by society at large on our women of today. Yes, fellas, believe it or not, it's probably felt by most of the women in your life. I mean, wake up. Hashtag me too. In many ways, it's the basis of the campaign Heather and I created, The Sexiest Truth. I think what the future holds is beauty for all. And in fact, I'm going to put the challenge down and put it out there for you guys. You know what? Heather has agreed to give some of her product to you guys to give to your gals. And all you have to do is you drop a comment in the comment section here on the YouTube channel about one of the magnificent ladies in your life. Short, sweet, to the point. Tell us what's so wonderful about her and how you've learned so much from her. She'll appreciate it. Beyond just the lip service, she's actually going to get some lipstick, possibly. You could win. It's part of our celebration of our one-year anniversary here on the channel. And again, we're about community, giving you some good advice, telling you some great tales, and having a lot of fun and learning something in the process. Something that's going to inform tomorrow's journey for all of us together. I thank you for joining me today. I'm Jeff Oppenheim. Until the next time, stay safe, stay well, and stay sexy.